All right. So hi, everyone. And this chapter will be about fluid mechanics. So this is an episode from the Big Bang Theory where they te they're testing this non-Newtonian fluid. And it becomes solid uh, when subjected to um, force. So this is only made out of cornstarch and water. And you can actually um, put it in a pool and test it out as well. So, so you can walk on this um, fluid. Right. So anyway, we'll talk about surface tension um, in the last second to the last part of this lecture. Okay, so, all right. okay, so in this lecture, we will be talking about the meaning of density and pressure of a fluid and how they are measured. Uh, we will learn how to calculate the buoyant force that a fluid exerts on an object immersed in it. We will be talking about how to use Bernoulli's equation to relate pressure and flow speed at different points in certain types of flow. And then we will be also talking about the significance of laminar versus turbulent fluid flow and how the speed of flow in a tube depends on the tube size. Lastly, we will uh, know um, how viscous and turbulent flow differ from the ideal flow. All right, so with that, before we begin, let's look at these two very interesting looking sea creatures. Hmm. So the first one is a tail spot wrasse. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And the second one is a manta ray. So the tail spot wrasse is only about 10 centimeters long, while the manta ray is more than five meters long. So when they swim, the manta ray has to put more effort than the tail spot wrasse because it needs to flap its wings continuously so it won't sink. So the tail spot wrasse, on the other hand, easily floats in the ocean without much effort. So as you can already imagine, the surface areas of these two creatures are very different, and that has an effect of, on their motion underwater. So in this lecture, we will learn about fluid mechanics, both at rest and in motion. All right, so first let's define what is a fluid and what is density by examining gases, liquids, and the density. All right, so, all right, again, as I've mentioned, we will be defining what a fluid is. So a fluid is any substance that can flow and change the shape of the volume that it occupies. So it can be in a form of a gas, oh, sorry, a gas or a liquid. So if both, if both gas and liquid are both fluids, then what sets them apart? Well, fluids have this thing called cohesion. So the molecules in a liquid are close to one another. So they can exert attractive forces on each other and thus uh, they tend to stay together. So this is why the quantity of liquid will remain the same as it flows. So in chemistry, Liquids are formed when gaseous molecules establish connections with another gaseous molecule. And this is um, and this bond or this connection is called a covalent bond. On the other hand, gases are separated on average distances larger than the size of a molecule. So the forces between molecules of or gas molecules are weak, so there is little to no cohesion, and the gas will easily be able to change in volume. So that's why when you open a tank of gas, the compressed oxygen will expand to far greater volume. So now that we have established what a fluid is and what the difference is between liquids and gases, let's look into an important property of fluids or solids. So basically uh, any state of matter, and that is what you call the density. So we will talk a lot about this in the next two modules when we start talking about thermodynamics. So anyway, the density is defined as an object's mass per unit volume. If, for example, we have a block of ice, we call that block of ice as a homogeneous material. And when you say homogeneous, it means that the density of the object is the same all throughout. So mathematically, the density of an object 
is represented by the Greek letter Ra. So this is Ra, not P. So it is given by the mass of the material and uh, the volume occupied by the material. And its SI unit, as you can uh, deduce from this, is kilogram per meter cube. As the mass, um, the SI unit of mass is kilograms and the volume is in cubic meters. All right, so it's possible for some materials to have the same density even though they have different masses and different volumes. And this is because the ratio of mass to volume is the same for both objects. So let's look at this example um, with a steel wrench and a steel nail. So the, you, as you can see, they both have the same density because the wrench and the nail are both made out of steel. So this means that when you want to find, let's say, the volume of copper or, I mean, sorry, a copper wire, then you can easily solve for it just by looking at the density of copper and weighing your copper wire sample. So the table here shows the densities of some common substances. So one of them is also steel or iron. Another term that you may have heard before is the specific gravity of a material. So this is just the ratio of the material's density to the density of a standard substance. So water is the one that they typically use. And uh, don't mistake the name specific gravity also as being something related to gravity because um, they aren't. The specific gravity is more like the relative density of the material. So compared to this standard fluid, so this is the that specific gravity. Okay. All right, so let's have this first example, the weight of a room full of air. Find the mass and weight of the air at 20 degrees Celsius in a living room with a four, four by five, uh, four by five meter floor and a ceiling three meters high and the mass and weight of an equal volume of water. So as you can see, we can find the volume of this room by multiplying the um, length, width, and height given by 60 meter cubic meters. Okay, the mass of the air can be found by, because we know the density of the air given by this wait, previous table here. So air at one atmosphere, uh, 20 degrees Celsius is 1.2 kilogram cu per cubic meter. So applying that to our equation, and we also know the volume we calculated for it. So that's 72 kilograms, right? The weight is just given by mg. So we know the mass, plugging in the values times the gravitational constant of 9.8 meters per second squared, giving us um, a weight of 700 newtons. Or if calculated in, I mean, sorry, if converted into pounds, we have 160 pounds. Now, for the mass of the water, so we know that the water is also given here. And that's 1 times 10 to the third power. So plugging that in our equation here times the volume, which we have calculated, which is 6 times 10 to the 4 kilograms. It's the mass of the water. And then the, the weight of the water is equal to um, m times g. So that plugging in the values, we get 5.9 times 10 to the fifth power in newtons or 1.3 times 10 to the fifth power in pounds. Or we can also convert it uh, 66 tons. Okay. So this is just um, an example of how to use this table and also apply the equation for the density of a homogeneous material. So remember that this only applies if, um, if the density is the same throughout. Okay. It's homogeneous. All right, so now let's talk about pressure and pressure in a fluid. As I have mentioned, the density is dependent uh, on external factors such as temperature and pressure. So we will be talking about temperature in the next lecture also and uh, the whole of uh, thermodynamics. Um, so we will focus on 
Um, so, sorry, we will be talking about um, both the temperature and pressure in the in our lectures in thermodynamics. But in the next lecture, we will be talking about temperature first. But here, um, this is where we introduce pressure is what I'm trying to say. Anyway, before we get to that, let's imagine a fluid um, exerts a force um, that is perpendicular to any surface in contact with it. So let's say that you are in a swimming pool, it's summer, and the part where the water touches you doesn't it feel like you are blanketed by something? So it's like um, something, uh, there's something that, you know, it's the water, but like, it's like you're, you're enclosed in something, right? So that is the force of the fluid that is exerted on you. So even when the pool looks like it's at rest, the, but the molecules that make up the fluid are in motion. So the force exerted by the fluid is due to the molecules colliding with their surroundings or you, you're that um, surface area. So let's derive the equation for that force. Imagine that there is a surface within a fluid at rest, this one. And the fluid has to exert forces of equal magnitude, but opposite direction on the surfaces to sides here. So in the image, we have a small surface that has an area dA centered on a point in the fluid. So the normal force exert exerted by the fluid on each side is given by dF with a perpendicular symbol as a subscript which depicts that it is a perpend it, it is perpendicular to the surface. So the force is perpendicular to the surface. So this means that we can define the pressure at that point as the normal force per unit area, uh, dF uh, perpendicular over dA. If the pressure is the same at all points of a finite plane surface with area A, then the pressure P is just equal to the ratio of the net force, oh, sorry, the net normal force of one side of the surface and the area, or P equals F over A. That is, um, if the pressure is uniform at all points of that finite plane surface, you can just use P equals F over A. So we also define the SI unit of pressure as one Pascal or one PA which is equal to one Newton per meter squared. As you can see, because the force is, uh, the SI unit of force is Newton, the uh, SI unit of area is meter squared. So another thing that you may have heard in chemistry class is what you call the atmospheric pressure um, with a unit of one atmosphere or one ATM. This is the, the pressure of the Earth's atmosphere, and this pressure varies with weather changes and elevation. So the normal atmospheric pressure at sea level is just one atmosphere. Oh, sorry. All right. <laughs> and this is, um, this is what is usually used in problems. So take note of this unless uh, we specify otherwise, okay? Another thing to note is that the pressure is not dependent on the orientation of the surface. So only the force and the surface area. So if you imagine the tail spot wrasse again in the manta ray, you can already see how much harder it is for the manta ray to move in the water because its surface area is quite large. Okay, so here we have another example. So a room described in example uh, 12.1, what is the total downward force on the floor due to an air pressure of 1 atm. Okay, so we know that um, the force is just given, so the pressure is given by P equals F over A. So again, because um, we are assuming that the pressure is uniform, so we can use P equals F over A, or when we want to find the perpendicular force, that's F equals P times A. To get A, we need to multiply the length and width of the room that's just given by four meters times five meters, which is equal to an area of 20 meters squared. So this is a typo, kind of take note of this, um, should be meters squared. Okay, so um, F equals PA. We know um, the pressure given by this one. So 
one ADM is just um wait, sorry. The pressure. All right, anyway, so yeah, that's how we got one times ten, uh one point zero one three times ten to the fifth power newton per meter squared. Um, equal to 20 meters squared. And so your perpendicular force is equal to 2 times 10 to the 6th power newtons or 230 tons or 4.6 times 10 to the 5th power um, pounds. Okay. All right. So if the weight of the fluid can be ignored, then the pressure in a fluid should be the same throughout its volume. But the fluid's weight is not negligible most of the time, and the pressure variations are very important. So when you climb a mountain or you're at an airplane, you can feel that change in pressure, right? So you feel something in your ears. And that uh, is because the higher the altitude, the, less the, the lesser the atmospheric pressure. So this is why airplanes need to be pressurized. And when you dive at the bottom of the pool, you can also feel that pressure increase in your ears. This means that pressure must be related to elevation. So let's try to derive an equation for that relationship. Given a uniform density of the fluid, meaning the density is the same throughout. So, um, yeah, so meaning the density is the same as, uh, throughout, as, I, as I've said. So, uh, also the acceleration due to gravity will also be the same. So, if the fluid is in equilibrium and we set an element um, of the fluid as this blue box here um, with area A, with area A, with a thickness of dy, then that element is also in equilibrium. So this means we can use Newton's first law in getting the net force on that element. So on the top uh, surface of the element, the force due to the pressure is given by P plus dP times the area. While the bottom surface, we have the pressure P times the area. And overall, the element also experiences the weight. So putting it all together, the net force along the y-axis is given by the force due to the pressure on the bottom surface minus the force due to the pressure uh, P plus dP on the top surface minus the weight of the element. And that is all equal to zero based on Newton's first law. So because, again, it's all in equilibrium. So we can then simplify this equation by dividing the equation um, by the area and rearranging it to get dp over d, dy equal to negative rho times g. So this is the density times the gravitational constant. So what this equation is saying is that when y increases, then the pressure decreases. If we move upward in the fluid, the pressure decreases. And this is exactly what you feel when you are diving. This is also why divers need to be careful when they swim back up the surface. So if they ascend too fast, they can get what you call the bends, which is a decompression sickness. So this means that they inhale gas at a higher pressure than the surface pressure. This is why diving actually really freaks me out because there are so many instances of your equipment going wrong in a dive. And when you're in too deep, you might not have enough time to ascend properly before running out of air. And that is quite scary. So anyway, the Halloween story is over. Let's go back to talking about what dp over dy equals negative rho times g means when the density and pressure are constant or uniform. So when this happens, the pressure difference between two points in a fluid is equal to negative of the uniform density of the fluid times the acceleration due to gravity times the difference of the height between the two points. So we can also call the difference of the height of the two points in the fluid as the depth uh, below the surface of the fluid, which we can denote as h. If we also take point two to be at the surface of the fluid, then we could denote it as P naught, um, where the subscript pertains to zero depth. This means that we can find the pressure at a depth 
in a fluid uniform density equal to the pressure at the surface of a fluid plus the uniform density of fluid times the acceleration due to gravity and the depth below the surface. So just remember that when it comes to the pressure, only the depth is concerned as long as the level is the same. So this, this, is, an, this is an example. So um, then the pressure at all points at that level will be the same. Okay, so um, going back. So what this last equation tells us is that if we increase the pressure at the top um, surface, then the pressure P at any depth will also increase by exactly that same amount. And this is what we will call Pascal's, Pas no, sorry, Pascal's law. One example of this and one that we will be talking about um, in thermodynamics is the piston in engine. So if you push down the piston that is in a tight container, the pressure in there will increase and that pressure will cause the gases in there to combust. And that is how um, a, ba a basic engine works. So a clearer statement for Pascal's law is the pressure applied to an enclosed fluid is transmitted undiminished to every portion of the fluid and the walls of the containing vessel. So if let's say we have here a hydraulic lift, a piston with a small cross-sectional area exerts a force F1 on the surface of a fluid, such as, for example, let's say it's oil. So the applied pressure F1 over A1 is transmitted uh, through a connecting pipe to a larger piston of area A2. So the applied pressure on both cylinders will be the same according to Pascal's law. So this means P equals F1 over A1 is equal to F2 over A2. This means that you can also find the forces on each piston by just rearranging this relation. Like if you want the force applied on the second piston, you can get it uh, through FD, uh, F2 equal to A2 over A1 times F1. So there are two different quantities of pressure that we need to take note of. Um, this is like picking a reference frame in Newton's laws. So when we say gauge pressure, we mean the excess pressure above the atmospheric pressure. So let's say you have a car and you bring it to a tire shop because you notice that one of the tires is flat. So to confirm that it's flat, Dr. Tire connects a pressure gauge and the gauge read, reads zero. So what this means is that the pressure inside the tire is equal to the atmospheric pressure. So there is no excess pressure above the atmospheric pressure. So if Dr. Tire inflates the tire and it reads 30 PSI, which is about two times 10 to the fifth power um, Pascals, um, this quantity is the excess pressure above the atmospheric pressure. So you can think of the gauge pressure as measuring from the frame of reference where your initial pressure is zero, and this ignores the atmospheric pressure. In the cases where it is in partial vacuum, the pressure gauge will have negative values. On the other hand, when we talk about the absolute pressure, uh, this is the total pressure. So it's uh, 2 times 10 to the fifth power pascals, which is the tire pressure, plus the atmospheric pressure of 1 times 10 to the fifth power pascals. Okay. <laughs> this is just a scene from the Big Bang Theory. I'm not sure if you have ever watched it, but there was a funny quote there um, where Sheldon's brother says, sometimes you can't patch a tire, you just got to buy a new one. Actually, that's always the case. Never patch, buy new. Anyway, let's move on to this example. So finding absolute engaged pressures. So water stands 12 meters deep in, the in a storage tank whose top is open to the atmosphere. What are the absolute engaged pressures at the bottom of the tank? Okay, so with that, we need to use our equation for both. Okay, so remember that the absolute pressure is just given by the gauge um, plus the the gauge plus the atmosphere. So we can use our equation a while ago that we have derived um, for 
sorry, this one. The pressure at depth H in a fluid of uniform density. Okay? All right, so we know that the atmospheric pressure is initially 1.1 times 10 to the fifth power um, P pascals, which we have, where did I write? All right, so I didn't write it, but I mentioned it. Okay, so it's one times 10 to the fifth power um, Pascal. So remember that um, that is the standard atmospheric pressure, which we'll be using here. And then we also know the density of air, which is um, one times 10 to the fifth power kilogram kilograms per meter cube. I think this might be a typo. Wait, we're in... Oh, it's water. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Water is one times out 10 to the third power. Okay. So there's an excess number of zeros there. So kindly take note. Right. In or in this example, it should be only a thousand, one thousand kilograms per meter cube because the um, density of water is 1 times 10 to the third power only times uh, the gravitational constant of 9.8 meters per second squared and the height we are given a depth of 12 meters. With that, the pressure is given by, or the absolute pressure rather, is given by 31.816 pounds per inch squared or 2.16 atmosphere. For the gauge, it's just basically the um, the, the absolute pressure minus the uh, atmospheric pressure. And that is just 1.18 uh, times 10 to the fifth power pascals or 1.16 atmosphere. Okay. So just remember, gauge pressure is the one um, where you need to subtract the atmospheric pressure. When you get the absolute, you can use the, um, the equation that we got for pressure in a fluid. Um, of depth um, H. Okay, so let's move on to how um, how this concept is applied. So this is an example of a pressure gauge, and it's called a Borden type pressure gauge. And the way it works is that um, when the pressure uh, is increasing in inside the tube, uh, when the pressure inside, um, sorry. So it works by increasing the pressure of the tube inside. When the pressure inside that flexible tube will so, okay. So think of it that initially this is collapsed. This tube, this tube is collapsed, right? So no air is passing through this tube at first. So this means the reading will stay here at zero. But if you inflate it, then the the needle will be moving depending on how strong the pressure is, okay? So this tube will stretch out and um, move the needle. And that is how a simple, um, a simple pressure gauge works. So let's relate that to um, health sciences. How do we measure blood pressure? Well, let's first discuss this uh, contraption called a manometer. So the way it works is that there is a U-shaped tube that contains a liquid or density raw, which is usually mercury or water. And the left end of the tube is connected uh, to uh, the container where the pressure is to be measured. And the right end is open to the atmosphere and uh, at pressure P0 equals um, the atmospheric pressure. So the pressure at the bottom of the left and right side um, should be the same since they are in the same level, right? So this means that when the water levels increase, then the pressure has increased. So the same thing happens when you get your blood pressure checked. So you initially start at the same atmospheric pressure as the cuff, and then the cuff is applied pressure, so um, it inflates, right? And then um, the the contraption notes the peak pressure in which the patient's systolic pressure 
and the lowest pressure, which is the diastolic pressure. Okay, so in a manually operated blood pressure monitor, so it probably still uses a Borden type pressure gauge, and that is how uh, the readings are made. Okay, so here is an example. So a manometer tube is partially filled with water, oil, um, which does not mix with water, is poured into the left arm of the tube until the oil-water interface is at the midpoint of the tube as shown in the figure. Both arms of the tube are open to the air. Find a relationship between the heights H oil and H water. So here we can have uh, two equations for the pressure because we know that at uh, this point, the pressure should be the same. So that means that we can just equate um, the P naught uh, plus uh, the raw, the sorry, the density of water times uh, the gravitational constant times the height um, of the water, and um, times the the initial pressure for the oil times the density of oil times um, times H oil. Oh, sorry, I think we are missing the gravitational constant here because we will be canceling that out later. So. When we equate these two equations to both sides, this will cancel out. And then we can also um, multiply both sides by 1 over g, so canceling out the gravitational constant, leaving us with this relationship between the heights of the, H, the, of the oil and the water as H oil equals to the density of the water over the density of the oil times um, the height of the water. All right, so our next topic will be about buoyancy. So remember our main dude Archimedes. So he said, give me a lever long enough and a, and a fulcrum on which to place it and I shall move the world. Well, he also has a lesser popular quote and this is about buoyancy. So Archimedes's principle states that when an object is completely or partially immersed in a fluid, uh, the fluid exerts an upward force on the object equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the object. So how does this statement apply to us in our daily lives? Well, this principle explains um, why we float on water also especially in the Dead Sea? Or why do hydrogen or helium balloons float in air? So all of these can be explained through Archimedes' principle and the concept of buoyancy. So this isn't fact-checked, but maybe buoys, like the ones in the ocean, are called as such because of the science of how it floats. Anyway, let's see how we can prove this principle. Let's say that there's an arbitrary element of a uh, fluid in a beaker as shown in this image. So the dotted lines is this element of fluid and it's at rest. So we know that it is in equilibrium and it has these arrows labeled DF perpendicular with a perpendicular symbol. So this are the forces that are exerted on the element surface by the surrounding fluid and all of these forces are perpendicular to the surface. So remember that the fluid is in equilibrium. So the sum of all the y components of force in this element of fluid is zero. So what this means is that the sum of the y components of the surface forces must be equal in magnitude to the weight mg of the fluid inside the surface. So another thing to note is that the sum of the torques on the element of fluid must be zero. So what is a torque? So we didn't get to discuss um, the torque uh, before, but it is a measure of the force that can cause an object to rotate about an axis. So uh, the, with zero torque, the line of action of the Y component of the surface force must pass through the center of gravity of uh, this element of fluid. But what if we have a solid object instead of an element of fluid, but the shape will still be the same as the element of fluid? 
Um, this means that the pressure at every point should be the same. So the total upward force exerted on the object by the fluid will also be the same. And the magnitude will again be the same as the weight of the fluid is displaced um, to make way for that object. So this upward force um, is what you call the buoyant force on the solid object. And the line of action of the buoyant force, again, passes through the center of gravity of the displaced fluid. So what this tells us is that, for example, you have a balloon. So the weight of the balloon, including the gas, is the same weight as the weight of the air that's displaced by the balloon. So for fishes, the flesh of the fish is denser than water. So you would imagine that it should, it should sink, right? But then these fish have a gas-filled cavity within their bodies, making their average density the same as that water's density. So this means that the net weight of the fish becomes the same as the weight of the water that the fish has displaced. So we can say that an object whose average density is less than that of a liquid can float partially submerged at the free upper surface of the liquid. So much like this boy over here. And you can also use this to explain how big, uh, big ships float. So you know it's made out of metal, right? right? So it should be quite dense and the mass should be heavier. But it's hollow inside, meaning that it's just mostly air inside the ship. So that's why its average density is less than that of the water. And that is how it floats. The greater the density of the liquid, on the other hand, the less the object is submerged. All right, so what I said uh, earlier is the greater the density of the liquid, right? So if you compare swimming in the Dead Sea or the ocean versus the swimming pool, you can't um, sink in the Dead Sea because um, the, the salt water content is so high, or rather the salinity is so high, that um, the density of that, that salt water is, is higher than that of um, pool water. And um, for, for the ocean, on the other hand, so you can try this in summer vacation. You can try floating on the ocean versus in the pool. So you, you'll definitely notice the difference of how hard it is to, to float in the pool, but it's very easy to float in the ocean. So how do we apply uh, this concept in a practical way? So a hydrometer is used to measure the density of liquids. And the calibrated float this one sinks into the fluid until the weight of the fluid it displaces is exactly equal to its own weight. So this means the hydrometer floats higher when the liquid is dense versus um, a less dense liquid. And a scale in the top stem permits a direct density. So this is the direct density reading. So this these are scales. All right. So the uses of hydrometers uh, in medical applications is for measuring the density of urine. So when uh, when a new year has has come in in campus, you need to submit a new medical record, right? So the the urine sample that you send that is um, exactly how the not sure if that's how they do it now, but uh, before that is how they they used that. Um, hydrometer to measure the density of urine. Anyway, let's talk about buoyancy um, even more with these uh, with this example. So a 15 kilogram solid statue is raised from the sea bottom. What is the tension in the hoisting cable, which is assumed massless, when the statue is at rest and when it's completely underwater? And B, when it's at rest and completely out of the water. Okay, so let's first get the volume of um, the, the statue. So that's given by, uh, so we know that the density is just given by um, raw equal to M over V. So to get the volume, we just need to divide the mass of the statue to the 
um, density of the gold. So the density of the gold, we can find it in the table. So I won't go back to that slide, but just trust me, it's there. It's given by 19.3 times 10 to the third power kilograms per cubic meters. And the mass of the statue is given here by 15 kilograms. That gives us a volume of 7.77 times 10 to the negative fourth power um, cubic meters. Now, in order to get the buoyancy, we know that the buoyancy is just given by the weight. So according to Pascal's principle, oh, sorry, Archimedes' principle. So um, that is why it's equal to uh, the mass of the salt water times the, the gravitational constant. Or we also know that you can get it by multiplying the density of uh, the salt water times the volume times the gravitational constant. So we just substituted the mass here from the equation of rho equals m over v. So that is how we got this. Plugging in all the values, we know that we can get this uh, from our table. We also know that we solved for the volume already. And of course, we have memorized the famous 9.8 meters per second squared, giving us a buoyancy of 7.84 newtons. Now, we want to get the tension as well. So we will need to apply some Newton's laws. And we know that it is, it is at rest, so we can use Newton's first law and equate it to zero. We also know um, the buoyancy already. We're looking for the tension um, when it's in salt water. And uh, we also know that the mass, uh, sorry, the weight is equal to negative m statue times g. Right, so we know the statue's weight, oh, sorry, mass, and also weight, actually, because we calculated it also earlier. Um, anyway, so we get uh, uh, m statue g minus psw, since uh, we know we equate it to zero, plugging in all of the values, the tension uh, when it's at rest and completely underwater is equal to 139 newtons. Okay, let's compare that. To right, let's compare that to at rest and completely out of the water. So what changes here is the density of air versus the density of water, which was was um one point zero three times ten to the third power, whereas here we only have one point two kilogram per meter per meter cube. So that's a huge difference for the density of air versus the density of water. So you can imagine that the tension when it's in the air should be um, should be heavier, right? Okay, so um, with that, we get a buoyancy for air of 9.1 times 10 to the negative uh, third uh, power newtons. And then um, since we don't need to um, consider the buoyancy here. It's negligible. So we can just um, get the air by um, mg, which is 147 newtons. Okay. All right. So surface tension, we already mentioned it a while ago when, uh, in the start when we talked about the non Newtonian fluid. So um, but that one's different, a different story. The the things that we derived here, um, the reason why it's called a non-Newtonian Newtonian fluid is because um, the effects that uh, are, are a result of all of the concepts we have here is not applicable there. It's more complex or complicated in the way it um, acts. Okay, I just showed it because it it was cool. So anyway, when swimmers are just about to rise from the water, they look like this, right? It's like they're enclosed in some kind of film made out of water. It looks like a cocoon of water. And this is a point where you say that uh, the point before the swimmer breaks the surface tension. So what does that mean? Well, exactly what I said. Surface tension is when the surface of the liquid behaves like a membrane under tension. And this is because the molecules of the liquid exert attractive forces on each other. So if you look at this insect also, on the upper right, you can see that the insect 
is light enough that it doesn't break the surface tension. And that is how it is able to walk on water. So I suppose if there ever was a liquid that had a strong enough surface tension, we could definitely walk on that fluid. So I think that experiment was uh, done already. But as I mentioned, it's because it's a non-Newtonian fluid. So if you have time to experiment, you can also research on how to make one using water and cornstarch, like um, in the GIF at the beginning. So going back to our topic, we have here an image on the left. And um, this is exactly what is happening to each water molecule. So as you can see, for a molecule at the center of the beaker, like uh, somewhere here, they are equally attracted in all directions. So on the other hand, the molecules at the surface will be drawn to the interior because uh, the molecules, um, there are no molecules up here. So the attractions will become unbalanced. So this means that the molecules on top will arrange themselves in a way that it maximizes their interaction with molecules in the interior to compensate for all the attractions that are lost. So meaning they create this layer because of that um, unbalanced attraction. So means that the, the bond between the surface um, molecules are much stronger than that of the ones inside that are equally distributed. So it is also because of surface tension that raindrops are spherical. So right, if you drop, if you have like a drop of water, it's like you, if for example, let's say you have plastic, like the plastic cover from books and you drop, um, you drop water, like little water droplets on, uh, on that plastic uh, sheet and you place them a bit far from each other. And you notice, so it doesn't have this like um, this rectangular shape or other shapes. It, it turns into a spherical um, looking shape. And um, if you also try to um, put or tilt the, the plastic sheet, then that droplet will merge with other droplets to create a bigger spherical sphere, uh, spherical shape. Okay, so um, so that is explained by surface tension. So even raindrops are also spherical, and um, right, and the figure at the bottom here is uh, what happens when you wash clothes with hot soapy water. So um, because uh, of all the dirt and all that, the, uh, and we also know that the surface tension of water is, uh, is quite strong. So we will need uh, to, to break that. We, we want to increase um, the... Yeah, we want to increase the surface area that the water will get into those clothes, the, the fiber of the clothes. And that's difficult to do because of surface tension. So when you heat the water and you add a surfactant, so it's in the name, so this is um, present in the soap, they will both help in reducing the surface tension. Okay, so... We've talked about um, fluids in equilibrium, and now we will be talking about fluid flow. So this is um, fluids in motion this time. So much like we did uh, the previous models, like Newtonian mechanics, we will also be having ideal idealized models for fluid flow because um, it can be extremely complex sometimes. So with that, Let's define what an ideal fluid is. So it is a fluid that is incompressible, meaning that the density cannot change, and that it is also not viscous, meaning that there is no internal friction. 
So as we will learn later, viscosity is a measure of its resistance to the formation at a given rate. So we don't want that in our ideal fluid. And then we also define what is called a flow line, which is the path of an individual particle in a moving fluid. And when we say steady flow, it means that the overall pattern does not change with time. This means that every element passing through a given point follows the same flow line. So again, these are the flow lines. And this is the, this whole thing is called the flow tube. Kind of looks like a plastic straw, sorry. So now a streamline, uh, another another um, term that we'll be talking about. Oh, wait, sorry. Um, so wait, I think I haven't discussed what a steady flow is. So that means the overall pattern doesn't change with time. So this means that ele every element passing through this given point follows the same flow line. Okay, all right. Wait, I think I mentioned it. Okay, anyway, let's move on to what the streamline is. So I feel like you hear streamline a lot in business. But anyway, it's a curve uh, whose tangent at any point is in the direction of the fluid velocity at that point. So streamlines are kind of like the overall direction of the fluid. So where um, regardless of the the flow line direction so the flow line is just the direction of or the path of the individual particle so this is just one flow line one flow line one flow line but where they're all going is what you call the streamline okay so don't uh, get confused with that so a flow tube now is uh, this imaginary pipe okay so this straw looking thing um, where the fluid lines are passing through given an imaginary element of area A. Okay, so this whole area A has flow lines and then the edges of that, the one that kind of looks like a straw or a pipe or a tube. So that is your flow tube. So again, this is like an imaginary pipe or barrier. And one thing to note though, is that flow lines, they can cross the sidewalls of the flow tube. So as you can see that, um, again, this image shows that. Now, there are two types of fluid flow patterns that we will be discussing. Um, the first one is called laminar flow. Okay, so this is when the adjacent layers of fluid slide smoothly past each other and the flow is steady. So it's from the word lamina, meaning a thin, a thin sheet. So you can, you can observe that when you blow out a match. So the flow of the smoke at first will be laminar. And then as you can see here, the pattern of, of the smoke um, became different. So this means at this part, it's not steady state anymore. And so this, um, this flow for the smoke is what you call the turbulent flow. So this means that the flow patterns, they change continuously. All right, so when you delve into higher physics, the continuity equation will be your best friend. So the continu can continuity equation, sometimes called the transport equation, is an equation that describes the transport of some quantity. So when you get to electrodynamics, you can also use this when it comes to electric charges. But in this lecture, we will focus on fluid flow. So what is the continuity equation and what um, so what it is telling us here is that the mass of a moving fluid doesn't change as it flows. So basically, what it says is that what goes in must also come out. And that is why the continuity equation for an incompressible fluid is given by the cross-sectional area of the flow tube at point 1 times the speed of flow at point 1, and that is equal to the cross-sectional area of the flow tube at point two times the speed uh, uh, sorry, the speed flow at point two. What this means, what this relation means is that the flow rate dV over dt is just equal to the cross-sectional area times the speed. So this means that um, 
this flow rate will have the same value at all points along any flow tube. This also means that the smaller the cross-sectional area, the, the speed of the flow will also increase. As I've mentioned, this applies also to electric charges relating to, for example, the current in the wire. So this means that the smaller the, the diameter of the wire, the faster the current um, can pass through it. And then the thicker the wire, the, the slower the current can pass. So that, that's um, the same thing that happens here. So with a bigger, um, bigger pipe, the, the flow of the, the fluid there will be slower than that of a thin pipe. So how else can you apply that? Where can you observe this in real life? So have you ever noticed that if you pour a large amount of honey, the flow rate is very slow. But as you run out of honey, the cross section of that is getting smaller and smaller. So this is making the liquid flow faster. So that can be explained um, by the continuity equation, which you can um, now definitely impress your family uh, the next time you pour out honey. So here is an example, the flow of an incompressible fluid. Um, an incompressible oil of density 8, uh, 850 kilograms per cubic meter is pumped through a cylindrical pipe at a rate of 9.5 liters per second. Fine, the first section of the pipe has a diameter of 80 centimeters. What is the flow speed of the oil? Next, what is the mass flow rate? And then the second um, question is the second section of the pipe has a diameter of four centimeters. What are the flow speed and mass flow rate in that section? Okay, so let's apply the equation that we found a while ago where uh, the flow rate is equal to the cross-sectional area times the speed. So in order to get the flow speed, we know that the uh, so we know the diameter, so we will be able to find um, the cross-sectional area. And then we also know the density, which is given by. Oh, wait, sorry. We know the volume of 9.5 uh, liters per second. Oh, sorry. This is the rate, right? Okay, so this is the rate. And then we also want to... Oh, this is just a conversion from uh, liters to cubic meters. Okay, so that's equivalent to 10 times... Uh, 10 raised to the negative um, third power, right? And then, all right, so we got the reason why it's four times 10 to the negative uh, two meters because this is the diameter. We are only concerned with the, the radius. So that is how we got a, an initial flow speed of 1.9 meters per second, or rather the, the, the at point one, the speed at point one, or the flow speed at point one is 1.9 meters per second. And then um, after that, the diameter is halved. So we, we know that the speed should be uh, way faster than the first one, right? So uh, in order to get the speed of the second pipe, we do the same thing. Actually, we use, um, we use the continuity equation. And um, yeah, that is how we get 7.6 meters per second. So, um, so because we already know the first one, we can apply that. And in order to get the the, air, the cross section area of the second one, we know the diameter. So that's just pi r squared for both of them uh, times 1.9, which is what we got here. That is how we got um, 7.6 meters per second. Or um, the, uh, the, the Second speed, sorry, the speed at point two is just uh, four times the uh, speed at point one. And then uh, in order to get the mass flow rate, so that's just the density times the flow rate, which is 850 kilograms per meter cube times 9.5 times 10 to negative uh, third power meter cube per second, giving us a mass flow rate of 8.1 kilograms uh, per second uh, for the um, for the 
initial one. Oh, sorry. At point one. And then I'll leave it to you to find at point two. But I think it should be the same. Right? Anyway, let's move on to Bernoulli's equation. So this equation states that the work done on a unit volume of fluid um, by the surrounding fluid is just equal to the sum of the changes in kinetic and potential energies per unit volume that occurred during the flow. So that's so, that's so long. So basically what it does is relate how the pressure, flow speed, and the height for flow of an ideal incompressible fluid. So all of these factors... Um, again, is related by Bernoulli into one equation. So how do we derive this magic equation mathematically then? So we will be going back to our work energy theorem discussion before. So to get the work done on this fluid element, the non-gravitational force that works on um, it is the pressure. So we know that the pressure is just given by the perpendicular force dF over an area dA. So the force um, at at point A is uh, the pressure uh, at 1 times the cross-sectional area A1 times dS1. And then the force at C here is the pressure at point 2 times the cross-sectional area A2 times dS2. And this means that the work done or dW on the element by the surrounding fluid is given by um, pressure at point 1 minus pressure at point 2 times dV, where dV is just the volume of fluid passing any cross-section at time dD. So this means that dV is just equal to A1, A1 this, this part, A1 dS1, and A2 dS2. That is how we got um, dV here. So as you can see, P, this one, this... This part at uh, C is negative because the force at C opposed the displacement of the fluid. So since we are dealing with other forces and not the conservative force of gravity, what we have computed so far is the change in the total um, mechanical energy. That's just the kinetic energy plus the gravitational potential energy. So this means that the net change in kinetic energy during time dt is given by dk equal to one half rho times dv times uh, v2 squared minus v1 squared. And the gravity that change rather in gravitational energy is given by du equal to rho times dv times the gravitational constant times y2 minus y1. Combining these three equations together, we get this fourth equation. And we are now left with Bernoulli's equation so how we got this so the work we just so work is equal to um k plus u right so this is dw that's why it's on the left side k so i the first component on the right side um plus uh u which is the component the second component on the right side and then we want to uh, we want to simplify this equation even further by eliminating the dV because that's uh, something that they all have in common. And then after that, we put all of the all of the important um, the important factors for each point on one uh, on opposite sides of the equation. So this is how we got the relation for. The pressure, the um, pressure, fluid density, uh, gravity, uh, elevation, and flow speed of um, the first point and the second point in the path. This gives us um, Bernoulli's equation for an ideal incompressible fluid. Uh, so that's pressure plus the uh, fluid density times the acceleration due to gravity times the elevation plus uh, one half of the fluid density times the flow speed squared is constant. So this means that uh, this value um, is the same at all points in a flow tube. And that is what um, Bernoulli was trying to say here. But 
One thing to remember is that Bernoulli's equation is limited only to certain situations. So remember that if the fluid is incompressible, if the flow is steady, and if the fluid is not viscous. And that is the only time that you can apply um, Bernoulli's equation. Okay, so this is surprising, right? What? Giraffes have high blood pressure. Um, so isn't that bad? Well, before we panic, let's go back to Bernoulli's equation. So it suggests that as blood flows upward at roughly constant speed V from the heart to the brain, then the pressure P will drop as the blood's height Y increases. So for blood to reach the brain with the required minimal pressure, the giraffe's maximum blood pressure, or what you call the systolic blood pressure, must be 280 millimeter of mercury or mmHg. So it's normal for healthy giraffes to have high blood pressure. So for humans, on the other hand, it's actually bad because it can damage our arteries, arteries rather, making them less, less elastic. And because it's less elastic, this decreases the flow of blood and oxygen to your heart. And that is how you can possibly develop a heart disease. Wouldn't we want to be giraffes now? Um, all right, so let's talk about the water pressure at home. So water enters a house, based on the figure, through a pipe with an inside diameter of 2 centimeters at an absolute pressure of 4 times 10 to the 5th power pascals, about 4 atmosphere. A, a 1 centimeter diameter pipe leads to the second floor bathroom 5 meters above. When the flow speed at the inlet pipe is 1.5 meters per second, Find the flow speed, pressure, and volume flow rate in the bathroom. Okay, so that's a lot. Let's start with getting the volume at point 0.2, which is on the second floor. So we get that um, by solving for the cross-sectional area at A1 given by... So we know that the diameter is 1 centimeter. Um, at point one, so we get um, so we get half of that because pi r squared. Wait, oh sorry, it's two. That is why it's one centimeter because um, two divided by uh, two is one. So that is how you get the radius of this pipe. Okay, I was uh, oh, all right. So that is how you also get point five centimeters squared here because it's. Um, half of this diameter for the pipe tube. And then we also know that the uh, flow speed at this point is 1.5 meters per second. And that is how we got the flow rate, oh, sorry, the speed, flow speed of 6 meters per second when it reaches um, 0.2. So now with that, we want, so now we know the flow speed, we will get the pressure this time. And in order to get that, we will be applying um, we will be applying this equation here, okay? Isolating P2. So we know that uh, the pressure at point one um, Oh, this is a typo. So this is not equal. This should be a minus. So remember that. Uh, all right. So um, P1 minus 1 half raw times V2 squared minus V1 squared minus raw G times Y2 minus Y1. So we're using water here. So we will need 1 times 10 to the third power kilogram per cubic meters as the raw value. So we will be applying that to this part and this part. We also know the speed we already calculated for V2, so we can just plug um, both of them here. And then after that, we also know the gravitational constant. Uh, we also know that uh, the height is five meters. So that's just Y2 minus Y1, right? So that's, um, that's how we apply this one. All right, so um, adding them all up, we get um, pressure at point 0.2 of 3.3 times 10 to the fifth power pascals or 3.3 atmosphere or 48 pounds per inch squared. Next, and last thing that we need to find 
is the volume flow rate, which is just given by, so it's at point two, right? In the bathroom here, up here. So we just need to get the cross-sectional area times the speed at point two. So both of which we know already. So that's given by, the flow rate is given by 4.7 times 10 to negative four meters cube per second or 0.47 liters per second. Next, uh, this figure shows a gasoline storage tank with a cross-sectional area A1 filled to a depth H. The space above the gasoline contains air at pressure P0, and the gasoline flows out to the bottom of the tank through a short pipe with cross-sectional area A2. Derive the expressions for the flow speed in the pipe and the volume flow rate. Okay, so... With that, we want to know um, the speed uh, at point two. So we can use our equation from Bernoulli's principle, where P0 is here initially. And then um, after that, this is P atmosphere. So this is when the gas has ex escaped already. So, all right. And then... Uh, we have one half uh, P, uh, sorry, raw V1 squared plus raw GH. And on the other side at point two, we have one half raw V2 uh, squared plus PG um, zero. So the height or the depth here is considered um, zero because uh, it, it already, so remember the pressure gauge, right? So this it's the other way around. Okay, so this is 0 0.0 and this is at height h. Okay, that is why um, it's zero here. So this is the point where it already escapes. Okay, so zero to h. So that is why um, initially, so at point one, uh, the, this component is raw times g times h. Okay, so now we have this equation equation, we've plugged in all the values, we know which ones are zero and which ones um, aren't, and then we isolate v2 squared, giving us this relation, and um, we will we will take uh, the, init, the, 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 the speed, rather, at point one equal to zero, and that gives us this uh, relation here, okay? And then for the flow rate, it's the same thing because it's at this point. So that's just equal to uh, the cross-sectional area at this point times the speed. Because again, that's the only um, that's the only thing that the flow rate is dependent on, the cross-sectional area and the speed of the flow. Okay. Um, I think this is the last example. It's what you call a Venturi meter, and it's used to measure flow speed in a pipe. We have to derive an expression for the flow speed V1 in terms of the cross-sectional areas A1 and A2. So with that, we will be using um, Bernoulli's principle again. And um, I think we can cancel out the, the, the difference in sorry, the, the final component here, right? There's a raw times G times H because it's just the same. So um, with that, we're left with um, this equation. So um, after that, uh, we know that, uh, we know that from, wait, where's that from again? Oh, our, yeah, the continuity equation, sorry, right? We know from the continuity equation that the volume at uh, 0.2 is just equal to the A1 over, or the cross-sectional area at 0.1 over the cross-sectional area at 0.2 times the speed at 0.1. With that, we can substitute uh, this value for V2 in our equation here. And that is how we, and then we move P2 to the left side and move uh, this um, on the right side and factoring out um, one half uh, raw V1 squared, uh, we, we get 
this relation P1 minus P2 equal to 1 half rho V1 squared times A1 over A2 squared minus 1. So with that, we isolate V1 and we get the square root of 2GH times A1 over A2 squared minus 1. Okay, so if you have any questions for uh, any of these examples, kindly send me a message. And so let's go back to talking, I mean, to talk about, to discuss about the Venturi meter. So we see that the pressure is uh, less at point two because the flow speed, the fluid flow speed is greater. So remember that when an incompressible fluid with negligible internal friction flows through a pipe of varying sizes, then this means that the pressure and the flow speed can both change. So where the cross-sectional area is small, then this means that the, the pressure is low, but the speed is high. So where the cross-sectional area is large, then the pressure is high and the speed is low. Okay, so how do airplanes fly? This is very interesting. So when, uh, so Bernoulli's principle can help with that. So as you can see, the flow lines here crowd together above the wings of the airplane. So this means that the flow speed is higher here than, and also the pressure will be lower. So just like the venturi throat, this means that the downward uh, force of the air on the top side of the wings will be less than the upward force of the air on the underside of the wing. So this means that there is a net upward force, which we will call lift. But lift isn't just simply due to the impulse of air striking the underside of the wing. Um, what greatly contributes to it is uh, the reduced pressure on the upper wing, okay? So our last topic is about viscosity and turbulence. So as we have mentioned earlier, viscosity is just the internal friction of the fluid. So you can think of this as the resistance in wires and circuits. So if you're pumping chocolate in a tube, like the guy from the School of Chocolate, you notice that the chocolate touching the tube will cling on the, the inside edges of the tube. And uh, the chocolate at the center of um, that flow will just um, uh, go out of that tube. So a viscous liquid will always tend to cling uh, to a solid surface in contact with it. So even lava, glue, honey, all of these are viscous fluids. And the thin boundary layer of fluid that clings on the tube or pipe walls are nearly at rest with respect to the surface, as shown here, right? So um, the closer it is to the surface, its potential, I mean, it's um, nearly at rest and uh, the speed of, or the velocity of the ones in the middle are uh, quite greater, okay? So again, um, in real life, you can notice this uh, with your electric fans, right? So when you're always, uh, when it's always turned on, uh, the fan gets dusty after a while. So that is also because of viscosity. So the, the dust particles that, that are too close to the fan um, uh, sticks to the fans, um, the fans, um, the yeah, the fan uh, the fan's edges okay so that that is how the the dirt or the dust gets trapped okay so next thing that uh, I wanted to uh, want to talk about is called turbulence so you always hear that in airplanes right so that happens to an airplane if there are uh, storms or if it's too windy or they're passing by a mountain and this causes turbulent eddies. So eddies here is not our favorite character from Stranger Things, but it is defined as the swirling of a fluid and reverse current. So we also learned about laminar and turbulent flow, right? So one good example of this is a faucet. So when you partially open the faucet, 
the flow of the fluid here is slow. So this is what you call the laminar flow. And then you can easily uh, see the flow of water um, on the image on the left when it's, oh, sorry, on the image on the left, right? So this is laminar flow. But, and this happens when you open the faucet slightly. But if you fully open the faucet, this becomes erratic and the flow pattern of the water becomes turbulent. So this means that you have exceeded the critical speed. So if you're curious, you can actually do this at home and you can um, measure at which turn or which um, lift of the faucet um, handle uh, gives you uh, the, the, this change in flow pattern that uh, moves from laminar to turbulent. That's a fun experiment. Anyway, let's talk about blood again. Normal blood flow in the human aorta is actually laminar. Um, but a small disturbance such as uh, heart pathology can cause the flow uh, to become turbulent. And this turbulence makes a noise. And that is why we use stethoscopes. So if you're curious, I have placed a link down here so you can hear what a heart murmur sounds like and what a normal heartbeat sounds like. So that's it for the end of this lecture. I hope you learned something about fluid mechanics and uh, kindly wait for the next one, which is about um, heat and temperature.